high quality custom products and perfected the one day remodeling experience so you can enjoy your new bathroom faster than ever before. It's a worry free bath remodel from the most trusted brand name in the business, Jacuzzi. For a virtual or in home appointment, call 800 826 9895. That's 800 826 9895. 800 826 9895. At Staples, school is always in session, and savings never take a holiday, especially now during Staples Teacher Palooza. You save big on everything for school, like 20% on all Crayola products, up to 40% on brands like Post-It, PaperMate, and Elmer's, plus 24-pack cases of True Clear bottled water are only $3.99. During Staples Teacher Palooza, teachers save big and so do you, with classroom deals for everybody. But deals end soon, so hurry to Staples today. Offers end for one, in-store only, limit one on water, while supplies last. Are you underpaid and overworked? Is a living wage and employee benefits like affordable health care more of a dream than a reality for you and your family? If so, it's time to form a union. Don't be denied the wages and benefits you deserve. Come together in a union with the power of numbers. A union is not a privilege. It's your right, and it will make a difference. Contact Teamsters Local 1932, a powerful and successful labor union in San Bernardino, by visiting teamsters 1932 org backslash organize to start today. Located in the heart of San Bernardino, California, the Teamsters Local 1932 Training Center is designed to train workers for high demand, good paying jobs in various industries throughout the Inland Empire. If you want a pathway to a high paying job and the respect that comes with a union contract, visit 1932trainingcenter.org to enroll today. That's 1932trainingcenter.org. Labor unions built the middle class, and the middle class built America. That's the message from Teamsters Local 1932, a strong and successful labor union based in San Bernardino that represents over 14,000 hardworking people across the Inland Empire. The Teamsters are ready to help you organize for better pay, increased benefits, and improved working conditions. Reach out to Teamsters 1932 at teamsters1932.org backslash organize to speak with an organizer today. One of the best ways to build a healthier local economy is by shopping locally. Teamster Advantage is a shop local program started by Teamster Local 1932 that has brought together hundreds of locally owned businesses to provide discounts for residents who make shopping locally their priority. Everything from restaurants like Corky's to fun times at SB Raceway and much, much more. If you're not currently a Teamster and you want access to these local business discounts, contact Jennifer at 909-889-8377, extension 224. Give her a call. That number again is 909-889-8377, extension 224. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about Michigan. Oh, Michigan. I wish there was a song I could sing. You wouldn't want to hear it, but I wish there were a song about Michigan that I could sing because I would do it and I would do it badly. Uh, but good on you, Governor Whitner. Good on you, the legislature. First time in decades, a state that has enacted the horrible right to work legislation designed to destroy wages, designed to, to, to worsen working conditions. Finally, a state has repealed it. Uh, good on you, Michigan. And, and again, Virginia, I wanted you to be the first. You done screwed that up. Next time. Better be next time. Uh, this This is a big day. This is a big day for working people in this country because finally the Democratic Party, I think, at least in Michigan, leading the way on how to stand up and fight for working people. This is going to give folks the opportunity to negotiate for better wages, hours, conditions, and yes, better, uh, better tomorrows. This is, this is good stuff. Also, also, it wasn't just repealing uh, the no rights at work law that the 
And the thing that bothers me about how Michigan did it, like thieves in the night in a lame duck. Uh, again, another reason that I'm against term limits and have been for a very long time. This idea that on their way out the door, people were looking for their next job and, and voted for this, even though nobody, the people of Michigan didn't want this. This was thrust upon them by the moneyed interests who want to do what? Well, crush wages. Uh, so good on, good on Governor Whitmer for this. Also, she signed legislation to bring back, to repeal uh, the, the ban on prevailing wage. Uh, going to restore prevailing wage laws in the state of Michigan. And look, you know, what's interesting to me, and I don't even, I don't know why states continue to pursue this. Uh, West Virginia, the perfect example. Uh, Jim Justice, the Republican Trump governor, uh, he said, look, and you can go look this up. He said, you know, we did what we did what you wanted. We passed that no rights at work thing. We got rid of prevailing wage and it didn't make anyone's life better. In fact, it made things worse. Because that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to create desperation situations for working people. And well, the folks at the at the very top, the elites, our moneyed, our moneyed interests, well, they're going to do better. By now restoring prevailing wage, that means there's going to be a floor. That means if, uh, if, if, and this is where I want competition. Understand, at the end of the day, I want competition on the right things. Who does the best job? Who does it in the most timely manner? Who has the most qualified workforce? You know, who's going to, who's going to build the widget or whatnot or school or courthouse? Who's going to do it in the most cost-effective way possible, but also to make sure that it doesn't fall down? I don't think that's too much to ask, which is why I want a local building trades, which is why I want local craftspeople to do this stuff. What we know, and we've, we've seen these studies, they've been done for years. When you do away with prevailing wage, what you end up with is transient labor coming through, doing shoddy work. And interestingly enough, because Pennsylvania tried this, uh, interestingly enough, the bids don't come down. I know. It's, you would think if you got to cheat your entire workforce out of wages and benefits and, and you got to do all of this stuff without there being any floor, you would think you would think the the costs would come down a little bit. No, that just means the contractors get richer. That's what it means. And I, I find it interesting because my my friends who are anti prevailing wage, they love to throw out this statistic. You know, you know, if, if we just had prevailing wage, because this is how they sell this. And for people who don't know, this is the sales tactic. They say, you know, if we got prevailing wage in the state, because they're doing it in Pennsylvania right now, we could save 25%, 30% on a building project. So that, you know, that school that's going to cost, let's say, a million dollars to build, that's not going to. We could save 30% of that. Think of how many more schools we could build. This is their argument. And it, on its face, you go, yeah, if you could save 30% more. You could build 30% more schools. And, you know, simple-minded folks go, yeah, that's how it goes. Problem is, is what we know, again, as I've said, the studies are conclusive, that 30% savings, if it were there, and I'm going to tell you in a second that it isn't, it's just going to go into the contractor's pocket. Now, for anyone who knows, to save 30% on a, on a building project, the working people, you know, the people who work for a living, they would have to not only work for free, they would have to pay the contractor because labor costs are anywhere between 20 and 25 percent of the cost of a building project. You can look it up. It's right around 25 percent. So if you're going to save 30, where's that other 5 percent coming from? Are, are you, you going to strong arm the workers for their lunch money? Is that what's coming? They're dishonest in every way, shape or form. Now, the reality is, is what they're on it, what they're actually trying to say without saying it. They're just saying, hey, we can save on building projects. What they're actually saying is we're going to screw those workers out of, out of wages. We're, they're going to get less, less health benefits, uh, less retirement security. Uh, we're going to cut corners at every opportunity so that we can save, save some money. And what they really mean is they're going to cut employees' wages by 25 to 30 percent. That's what they mean to say. But they don't want to say that out loud because you'll go, wait a second. I might, wait, I, that's my job. But again, what we know is states that have strong union density, union workers earn between 18 and 25% higher wages, 
They have safer working conditions. They're more likely to be covered by uh, health security, health insurance, and some retirement security. Th those, them's the numbers. Them's the facts. And when a state like Michigan back in 2012 wanted to ram that through, what they were saying to their people is, we want you to work for less wages in crummy conditions. Now, Michigan was the seventh highest uh, density state in the country. They had the seventh highest number of percentage of union members uh, in the state. They have now fallen to 11th, and that was a mission accomplished moment for the, for the moneyed interest. Uh, they were able to crush some workers. Now, this hopefully is going to bring that back. Uh, this, is, this is a good step in the right direction. At least I think it is. And the reason I bring this up is there was, there was an article been a couple of days now. Uh, Matthew Desmond over at the New York Times wrote a piece called Why, Why Poverty Persists in America. And he went on to explain, you know, his basic premise was this. Um, there are a couple of factors that keep poverty high. Uh, one, he writes, is the unrelenting exploitation of the poor. Because in this country, it's extremely expensive to be poor. And he said the other one, uh, is the decline of labor unions. Something that I've been talking about, mm, I don't know, for all 18 years I've been doing this show. And as he points out, with unions uh, basically out of the picture, you have corporations who have just obliterated the 20th century. As he writes, corporations have chipped away at the conventional mid-20th century work arrangements, which involved steady employment, opportunities for advancement, and raises and decent pay with some benefits. Um, he, he basically points out that, look, you know, uh, our parents and our grandparents' generation, they had jobs. Those jobs uh, paid good wages. Uh, those wages gave them the opportunity to buy homes, to, to save for retirement, uh, to go on vacation, to raise their children, to do all of these things that we, we pined for. And now what we do is we look at the millennials who are stuck at home, and they've got jobs. They're still stuck at home because they can't, they can't find reasonable reasonable housing that they can afford and then do all of the other stuff. Honestly, you know, if you got the chance to stay home and save money, do that. But the sad reality is what's happened in this country is labor has been crushed by the big moneyed interests, the ability of the next generation to earn that living that, that I, I thought of as a birthright. You go out, you get a job, that job pays you a good wage. Uh, you work hard, you play by the rules, you get ahead. That was the that was the calculus right there. Work hard, play play by the rules, get ahead. That was it. It was like two plus two equaling four. It was that simple. But that's been broken down now that we've got corporate masters and a, a government. You know, I've had some people tell me, our government's broken. No, our government is not broken. It is functioning perfectly. Washington is func functioning perfectly, ex exactly as it's supposed to, according to our, our, our very well-to-do. It can't accomplish anything that you or me or working people want and need. No, no. And that's by design. But, you know, if corporate America wants a tax cut, rich people want a tax cut, mission accomplished. Uh, if we need to bail out a bank, mission accomplished. They can do those things. But to ensure that, that every kid gets, gets fed breakfast and lunch at school, oh, sorry, can't afford that. To ensure that workers have decent wages, hours, conditions, to ensure that there's opportunity for families. No, no, health care? Oh, heavens forbid, no. Now, what Desmond points out is he said, look, you know, Americans have access to cheap, mass-produced products. And you hear this all the time from the right. Well, um, America's poor. You know, they're not really poor. You know, they're not, they've got refrigerators, they've got air conditioning, they've got cell phones. Look at them with their cell phones. When the reality is basic necessities in this country are those things. When was the last time you were able to eat your cell phone? When was the last time your cell phone, oh, I don't know, gave you medicine when you were sick? When was the last time your cell phone diagnosed a problem when, when your kid was sick? All of the things that, and again, I go back to when I was a kid. And, in, you, know, you know, back in the 70s was not a great time for a single mother. You know, we struggled. But I go back to that time period and I go, you know, 
all of the obstacles that we faced are still here, but we just have a couple of little extra luxuries. And still, we're not getting jobs to the people who need it. Now, the, the, the thing about what's gone on since the pandemic is wages at the very bottom have gone up, which is interesting to me because you're seeing a lot of, a lot of those low-wage employers cl closing up shops saying, no one wants to work. Yeah, no one wants to work for poverty wages. Nobody's going to go back to working for minimum wage 60 hours a week. No one's going to do that. And this is what we need as a country. We need this, this shakeup. And as, as Desmond points out in his article, um, you know, we need stronger labor unions. We need to be able to, to negotiate for the wealth that's being created because after all, and this is fact, we are still the wealthiest country on this planet at its wealthiest moment in history. And you're going to tell me that we can't get living wage jobs for people? You're going to tell me that we can't ensure that, that no child goes to bed hungry or no veteran goes, goes to bed on the streets? You're going to tell me we can't, we can't solve our problems? No, we choose not to solve our problems. And the people who choose that are the folks at the very top who have all the money right now. The thing is, is that we, all of us, th those of us who have outprocreated them, it's time for us to put down the red hat and the blue hat and come back to somewhere near the same middle area and start saying, this is what we demand, health care, education, opportunity. This is, this is the wheelhouse. All that divisive stuff they throw out to pit us against each other, at some point, at some point, we got to put that down. Just my thoughts. Want to hear yours? You can email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Let's take a quick break. Right back. Stick around. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. The phone lines are open. Give Rick a call at 1-866-416-RICK. That's 1-866-416-7425. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I was watching clips of Mike Kelly, Pennsylvania representative, uh, seated on the House Ways and Means Committee. And they were talking to uh, the small business owners about how, you know, how difficult it is you know, to, to keep talented workers because health insurance is so expensive, uh, especially in rural areas. And it struck me that everyone was complaining. Uh, no one was talking about, you know, what we should be doing to solve the problem. And again, you know, D.C., again, as I said, working exactly as it's supposed to, uh, pointing out all the problems over there, over there, over there, and not really solving them. This health, health insurance issue could be easily solved. We could do what most other industrialized nations have done, have one big giant insurance pool. One big pot. And I've said before, I don't care if it's public or privately run. One pot that covers you from cradle to grave where risk, again, any basic insurance you know, risk assessment is going to tell you the bigger the, the pool, the, the, the less the risk. I was listening to Mike Kelly talk about you know how they attempted to lower costs for health insurance for their workers by going to an 80-20 plan because you know that's going to lower the cost. Of that. No, that didn't work. They went to a 70-30, then a 60-40, and then he finally said 50-50, and I'm going, well, why bother? Why not just give like a grocery card 
and say, you know, hey, good luck at the grocery store. Maybe the, maybe the pharmacist will give you some advice in aisle three. And, and, and again, I, I sympathize with, with small business owners. I do. Insurance costs are way out of control. But we never seem to point our finger where, where a lot of it happens. We got a lot of CEOs with their hands in the cookie jars. You go, what exactly do you do here? We've got an enormous administrative state that we really don't need. We could put those, those people to work in other areas in the medical field. Like actually caring for people. You know, every dollar we spend on advertisement, every dollar we spend on, on you know, paperwork, on shuffling papers around, are dollars that aren't being spent helping people. And it's remarkable to me that, you know, we're still divided on this. Oh, I want my private health care. And then you get sick. And look, I've seen this happen over the years where someone has, you know, paid into their health insurance for, for decades that never needed it. And then something big happens. And now they're out of work. They're out of work for an extended period of time. And they go, oh, sorry, you're not working anymore. We're not covering you anymore. You can have COBRA. We'll give you this wonderful thing called COBRA, which no one can afford because it's, it's extremely expensive. And now you're out of luck. But I paid all those years. What did, what did I get? You got nothing. Now, look, I'm not even 100% opposed to some of the, the right-wing ideas of the past. The problem is, is the Mike Kellys of the world don't have any solution. It's attack Obamacare. It's all, it's all the Affordable Care Act's fault. That's their talking point. No solutions, just pointing out problems. Uh, I'm not even against the idea of health, health savings account. Start at birth. You know, add X amount of dollars into a health savings account, and, and you know, by the time you get to the end of your life, yeah, I'm not even against that idea. They're not even talking about that anymore. That's the thing that's just remarkable to me. So what we have right now, the best we can do right now, is to ensure working people have a voice on the job and, and can negotiate for, for a part of the profits that their labor creates and using some of that to get the best health insurance that they can. And unions do that better than anyone. And again, corporate America understands that, which is why at every turn they attempt to destroy labor unions. And I look at what Florida is doing right now as we speak. Florida is already a no rights at work state. They've been a, no, uh, a right to work state for a very long time. Uh, and there are unions there, surprisingly. I know, shockingly, you know, you, workers would want to form and, and come together. Who knew they would do that? They do in, in some right-to-work states, not at the levels that, that they could and should because the obstacles are too great. Well, Florida's not happy with having a, a very low density rate. They want to do away with especially public sector unions, those, those teachers, those government employees, those health care workers, those sanitation workers. Screw them. And... What right to work does is it gives you the right to freeload. So you have people who they want all the benefits. They want the good wages. They want the, the good health care. They want the negotiated pension. They want the safe working conditions. They want the job security of ending at will employment. They want all that. So they want the representation if they get in trouble because the unions have to represent them. If Even if they're not members, if they get into trouble because that's the law. What Florida is now doing is saying, you know what? If you don't have 50% plus one membership in your union, we're going we're gonna to dissolve it. We're going to decertify it. It's done. Now think about that for a minute. It's, already, it's not bad enough that Flor the unions in Florida are struggling and, and are fairly weak already. What you've got now is them to go even further because they want to eviscerate it. Because here's the thing. They know once they can get them decertified, getting them back in the door damn near impossible and this isn't new this is something that's been banging around and it's come back this is what republicans and, and again why i say republicans hate working people just look at what they do i don't care what they say I, there's a lot of rhetoric out there about how much they care about working people i don't believe they do because i see what i see what they do 
Now, in these environments, there's always my hope because I, I try to be optimistic in these moments because ultimately, I think back to my grandparents. My grandparents weren't overly politically active, but they were, they were staunch union members. They were heavily active in their unions because that's where their politic was. Their direct action was fighting in the workforce, fighting on the job for better wages, hours, conditions, for better opportunities. And it's why they were able to go in their lifetime from being homeless, living in their car, because they got married for the old-fashioned reason. Uh, they had to. Um, and my grandmother was thrown out of the house because they had to. Uh, they were homeless. And because of their work, they were able to raise three, three children. They were able to buy two homes. Uh, they were able to retire with dignity and respect. And, and they died in that home, not wanting, not needing, not relying on anyone, not begging anyone. They lived their life out with, with, with respect and dignity. And they led a good life because of those union jobs, because they fought for the stuff. They fought for those wages. They fought for those benefits. And it's how a truck driver and a cashier could earn a solid middle-class living and live in a solid middle-class neighborhood and give their kids opportunities. This is where the foundation of rebuilding, and I say this all the time, we've got to re revive the middle class by reshoring manufacturing and reunionizing. We need to reinvest and rebuild. And you do that with decent wages. You do that with good benefits. You do that with a opportunity. And you give people the chance, like I said, to work hard, to play by the rules, and yes, to get ahead. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1989. That was the day the Exxon Valdez oil tanker spilled nearly 11 million gallons of oil in Prince William Sound off the coast of Alaska. The ship ran aground and collided with Bly's Reef. Most people remember the captain was held primarily responsible for the spill. By his own admission, he had passed out after a night of heavy drinking. But a number of factors also contributed to the environmental disaster. The National Transportation Safety Board issued its final report over a year later. In it, the board concluded that fatigue, reduced crews, and problems with regulations and procedures regarding Exxon's drug and alcohol program all contributed to the spill. Union officials reported great concern regarding chronic fatigue of its members on merchant ships, reduced crews due to greater automation, and reduced scheduled ship maintenance. Crew members on the Exxon Valdez routinely worked 20 hours or more a day during routine cargo handling operations. The NTSB also concluded that vessel traffic service under the U.S. Coast Guard failed to properly track the Exxon Valdez. They had the ability to select a higher radar scale, but didn't. The Coast Guard suffered from reduced crews burdened with increased job duties as well. They also found that remote communication sites were inoperable on the night of the spill. The equipment was old, deteriorating from harsh weather conditions. Requested funding for new equipment had not been forthcoming. The Alieska Pipeline Company, for its part, failed to have an oil spill barge loaded and ready to go. Major cleanup efforts were conducted during the spring and summer months through 1992. But marine life and the environments were devastated. Long-term efforts at monitoring and cleanup continue today. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. Exciting news, people. Utopia is on the rise. Space Commander Elon Musk has announced that his magnificence, i.e. him, intends to construct his very own private town on 3,500 acres of farmland near his new Tesla plant southeast of Austin, Texas. More than a town, Musk explains that he will create utopia in Texas, promising an ecological paradise where his Tesla workers can live and do fun things like swimming, pickleball, and paying rent to him. 
The billionaire is certainly rich enough to erect his own muscopolis, but alas, the Utopia name is already taken. Indeed, I've been to Utopia, Texas, a small town west of San Antonio that was founded in 1855 by, cover your ears, Elon, Swiss socialists. Of course, history shows that a company town is ruled by the company, not by residents, much less socialists. And Musk has made clear at Tesla, Twitter, etc., that his personal whims rule over workers, consumers, our environment, and even truth. Which brings us to that ecological workers' paradise he's promising. Even as one arm of his empire was extolling his vision of a Garden of Eden situated along the beauty of the Colorado River, another arm was scheming to pollute it. Musk is asking Texas corporate control regulators to let him use the site to dump 140,000 gallons a day of his industrial wastewater into the Colorado. Excuse me, but that turns Elon's ecological paradise into a fraud. Worse, it adds up to Musk pouring 50 million gallons a year of his waste into the river, fouling the main water source for dozens of towns and hundreds of farms downstream. This is Jim Hightower saying Musk wants to extend the long sordid history in our country of company town hucksters, and his latest Texas scam is proof that we should never trust a billionaire promising us paradise. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I, I find it interesting that Marjorie Three Names uh, out there fighting, and good on her, out there at the D.C. jail today, uh, fighting for a more humane prison system. And, you know, something that I've been saying for years we should be, we should be working on. Uh, and good for her finally coming along. I mean, it, it took a bunch of, you know, white criminals to get finally locked up uh, to, to get someone's attention, and that's okay. Finally, we're here. Uh, but, you know, it, the irony does isn't lost on me that these are probably the same people that I've sat in lunchrooms with and heard how easy jail is and how it's, you know, three squares and a cot and how it's, you know, cable TV and gym memberships and all this stuff. And now when they finally go and they experience what it's really like, they, they don't like it. They don't like it at all. And, well, maybe, maybe, maybe this is that moment where, we can find some common ground and move forward here to share some thoughts on the big day in protest uh, with Marjorie Three Names. I've asked Ra Rachel Eisenberg to come talk with us. Rachel is a senior director of criminal justice reform at the Center for American Progress. You can check out their website, AmericanProgress.org. Rachel, thanks for taking time for us. Thank you for having me this evening, Rick. So are you, are you, do you find it as interesting that I do that uh, you've got uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene out there? This is kind of her champion issue. I know she believes that all of the criminals who are arrested on January for their activities on January 6th are all somehow political prisoners and martyrs and all this, you know, who, who are deliberately being treated poorly. Uh, but our prison system's a mess. I mean, I can definitely uh, agree with you on, on that last point, Rick. I mean, and, and I think it's really important for everybody listening to know that, you know, it's not just uh, a few people who are sitting in, in our jails and prisons across this country. Um, it is, you know, we have over 2 million people incarcerated. Um, and most of the time for, for nowhere close to as serious of an offense as the people who uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene was going to visit today. Uh, oftentimes it's for, you know, possession, a small possession of drugs or, um, you know, s s simple disagreements between neighbors, really things where we have this very over bloated system. And, uh, you know, many people uh, have been fighting to uh, find ways to safely reduce the number of people who are locked up in this country because we know just locking people up without the support that they need actually makes us less safe. Yeah. And well, well look, as long as we have a for-profit for prison system, I don't see any of this stuff going in, in a positive direction. And until she addresses that, um, I don't think we go in any, any different directions. But there's a difference here, isn't there? I mean, she's talking about the D.C. jail. Uh, our, that's, that's one part of this. You know, we've got you know, state and county prisons. We've got federal prisons. You know, we've got all of this hodgepodge of prisonry going on. So, you know, talking about certain things, I, I, I think I want to talk about apples and apples. Uh, but just locking people up in general, we're number one. We are the champions in locking people up, as I understand. 
Absolutely. And, you know, we, we lead the, we lead the world in some, you know, the, some of the highest incarceration rates. And, you know, that, that, you know, has no bearing on what we see happening in communities when it comes to, when it comes to crime. And I think that there's just a really false sense in people's minds that, you know, the more people you lock up, the safer we are. And we, as the, the US, United States of America, are a test case or a proof positive that that's not the case. Um, and what you were saying about apples to apples, so the, the, just to let people know that whenever someone is awaiting trial and they've, you know, it has been deemed that they have to be incarcerated prior to their trial, they're going to be in a jail, right. in a local jail. And so the vast majority of people who are in our jails have not been actually found guilty of a crime. And so they're, um, you know, and that is a system where we, you know, claim that people are innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, let me ask you this, because, uh, you know, I've had a whole bunch of people saying, you know, our, our political martyrs, you know, our political prisoners, every one of the people who are who are, are being held because of January 6th and their their behavior and their their crimes, they've been charged, right? Because I've got people telling me, no, no, they're holding all of these political prisoners without charges and they don't get to see lawyers and all of this stuff. That I got to think that's patently false. Yeah, I think that the, what people are responding to is the fact likely that the, the, not everyone's trials have happened. So um, I think that that is where that is where people spend time in jail right. awaiting, not awaiting, awaiting the trials. Now I can't speak to each of the individual cases that folks are, um, who are, are, um, you know, speaking about, but I think, you yeah. know, oftentimes, oftentimes, you know, DAs do take some time to, to file formal charges, but it's a much longer period of time until the actual trial. Yeah, no, the, the reality is, is, you know, uh, they all got their first days in court. I've yet to find anyone who sent me. This is the this is the this is the person who's being held. Uh, there's there's none of that. Uh, I believe everyone's been charged. Everyone is waiting, like you said, waiting for trial. In fact, as I've pointed out a number of times here in Pennsylvania, there was a a, a guy, a homeless guy, who stole three peppermint patties. The egregious crime of three stealing three twenty five cent peppermint patties off the counter. Uh, of this place he spent over 500 days awaiting trial locked up in jail 500 days for three pieces of candy and and look there's a lot to be angry about there's a lot that but nobody seems to be marching and holding rallies for that poor guy and what people also aren't asking themselves is well why do we have a legal system that that is respond is the thing that responds when someone steals your peppermint patties why are we not trying to address the fact that uh you know there's there may be some underlying cause oh yeah that's or, that's such a bigger discussion down the road that wow that boom that just blows everything up because then we got to talk about how we care for our homeless we got to care for the hungry the poor the sick you know that whole christian nation thing will come up that's a whole different can of worms. But this this is one of those things where you go, our justice system should be about justice. It should be about holding people accountable. It shouldn't be about retribution. It should never be about profit. But this is where we are. Yes. And, you know, when you have a system that very often, you know, makes spl very split second decisions, you know, about who should be held in jail pre-trial with limited information. You know, sometimes these hearings are a couple of minutes. You can't fully assess, the, you know, the person's circumstances, how likely they are to show up in court. And frankly, most people show up in court anyway. Um, and, and, you know, there's just this default that, you know, we have to set, you know, an, an amount of bail. And if someone can't pay because they're poor, they should, they should be locked up. That's it's insane. And the other part of this is a lot of people end up in jail because they don't have a proper legal representation. I mean, I look at our our public defenders and look, I know a couple of them. They do. They do as, as, as much as they can, but they're overworked, underpaid, understaffed, all of that stuff. And honestly, uh, you're never going to get the kind of representation uh, that someone who has resources does. So this is, again, if Marjorie Taylor Greene really wants to to make this an issue, there's a lot here, isn't there? 
Absolutely. And in fact, in a lot of places, although, you know, there are, there are some jurisdictions that are trying to change this, people um, don't have the opportunity to speak to their lawyer before their bail is set. That's just done even by, not even by a judge. And so being able to actually consult with a lawyer, have a robust hearing, fully assess whether someone needs to actually wait the, you know, however many months in jail before their trial date, uh, those are all reforms that really need to happen. Now, what I find interesting is I have all of my conservative friends who, who now this is the first time that they're actually dealing with the, the judicial system as it is, not as they believe. This is them dealing with the prison system and the jail system as it is, not as they believe. Again, it's not color TVs and gym memberships. Um, the justice system, the same thing. We all grew up reading the Constitution. I've got, I still have friends who carry it around in their shirt pocket. I really doubt they've ever opened it, but you know they've got it. But you have the right to a speedy trial. It's been a while. How long does it take to get a speedy trial? This is, again, if we really wanted to fix the system and deal with the system, this is a part of it as well. And, I mean, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up because people would be surprised at how long it takes to get through every stage in the process, even before the actual trial date. And that there's no wonder that people who are waiting in jail for their trial date are incentivized to take a plea deal because they want to get home to their families. They want to get back before they lose their jobs. There's a whole host of, of really, um, you know, really significant incentives for people who actually may not have committed any crime to, to, to take a plea deal. Yeah. You listen to the Rick Smith Show here with Rachel Eisenberg. She's Senior Director of Criminal Justice Reform at the Center for American Progress. AmericanProgress.org is their website if you want to check out the work that they do. Uh, now, I, I see a lot, and again, there's this weird kind of world that we're in. We've got Marjorie doing her, her song and dance, and then you've got other Republicans who are saying, you know, we're too lenient. We've got these progressive prosecutors out there who are just letting all the criminals run rampant. They're open. They're swinging the doors open, letting all the, the violent criminals. And it's all because of them, Rachel. It's because of these pro progressive prosecutors that the crime rate is going through the roof. It's their fault. So we've got to rein this in. And in a number of states, they're trying to rein in what prosecutors can do, uh, taking their prosecutorial discretion away figuring out how to recall and get rid of them. San Francisco, I guess, got one, got rid of one last year. Um, are these progressive prosecutors, are they responsible for all of this, this, this crime that we're told is out there? I mean, frankly, no. And what, you, what you're pointing out is how, how really persuasive and salient this, all the this fear-mongering about progressive prosecutors is. Um, but the data just doesn't bear it out. There, you know, study after study has looked at, you know, the way that crime has changed in jurisdictions with progressive prosecutors and found that there isn't, you know, there isn't a connection between the, the, the having a progressive prosecutor and, and any fluctuation in crime rates. So I also think what people don't understand are the things that progressive prosecutors are doing are not really, uh, they're not geared at. Uh, some of the some people who have committed really violent offenses, what they're geared at is, you know, putting forth new diversion programs for people who may have a substance use disorder. They're they're geared at looking at you know wrongful convictions, people who sh who shouldn't have been convicted of the crime that they're sitting in jail for. Yeah. These are really common sense and and reforms that en enhance justice and. There's just a really strong fear narrative out there about prosecutors that, that is unfounded. But no, no, I hear it all the time. The, the, our cities are burning, Rick. They're, the, they're crime riddled. You can't go across the street without being mugged or carjacked or robbed and all these horrible things. And look, I've been to all of our major cities just about. Uh, last, you know, last fall, we did a, a, a tour of, of many of the major cities in the Midwest. I didn't have any problems. Uh, I'm not seeing this, this cities burning. And I know that narrative is something they have to play into. But what a lot of these prosecutors are talking about is the guy who sat for 500 days waiting for a trial over three pieces of candy, maybe not leave him in jail that long, maybe find him a shelter, maybe find him a way, I don't know, a soup kitchen so he doesn't have to steal the, I don't know, maybe something else. And let's be clear, everybody deserves to not only be safe, but feel safe in their community. Right. And so and violence 
is happening in 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 our cities, you know, th not to the degree that you're, you, you know, describing, but there, there, there is really, you know, there are issues of crime that need to be addressed. But we have, we have our sights set on all the wrong solutions, right? The solutions to violent crime are in specific interventions that deal with people who are at risk and connecting them to things that we know prevent crime in the first place, like jobs, Job. like housing, like healthcare, all of, all of that, all of those, like education, all of those solutions exist. We have evidence that back it up. And yet all anybody looks at is, you know, it, trying to lock up the person for taking three peppermint patches. Yeah, well, it, we can't do that. Doesn't... That's too expensive, Rachel. All that stuff's too expensive. Too expensive to do this. I was just telling my son, it, it, to lock somebody up, it doesn't it cost like 40 grand a year. And wouldn't it be cheaper just to pay them to stay at the Holiday Inn and, and have room service? I mean, it would almost be cheaper to do that. It's how short-sighted how short -sighted we are, but yet we've got profit, we've got profit margins to make. Yeah, absolutely. And there are a lot of financial interests baked into the criminal legal system. It's not just the prison industry. It's the commercial bail industry. It's everybody who makes money off of when people are incarcerated to pay the, for their phone calls or for their commissary accounts like there's yeah. there's there's a whole host of corporations that profit off of people being in the legal system um that is very difficult to untangle but is 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 really a, a very perverse motivator for keeping the system the way it is yeah well someone one person's misfortune is another person's fortune i guess so you know i understand april is just around the corner um it is, as I understand, a month where we're going to be looking at, you know, how people who have been incarcerated uh, can re-enter society, the things that we should be doing. You know, it's kind of like an awareness month. We got an awareness month for everything. This sounds like a pretty decent one, um, and especially since Marjorie Three Names is, this is now her issue, uh, and I call on her to, to participate in this. You know, how do we ensure that people who are coming out of prison uh, or, or jails and have the opportunity to get jobs, housing, opportunities to not end up um, you know recidivism is high how do we how do we change that sure and uh yeah we're we're very um it's very important to you know to recognize that criminal justice reform is not just it's sort of at the front door of the jail but also that the you know, vast majority of people who are incarcerated eventually come home and they come home to their neighborhoods and their communities and it's in, and it's on everyone to ensure that we break down the barriers that make it um, very difficult for people to to restart their lives from you know all of the ways which people with criminal records are excluded from employment, who are uh, excluded from housing, who are excluded, who have difficult time accessing healthcare, and all of that can start from the you know for, while someone is still incarcerated. So people, there is lots of innovation happening around trying to actually get people um, access to healthcare before they leave custody. Um, to train people in the jobs of the, the labor market today, um, to connect people to the health care they're going to need when they go home, um, and to, to you know, find actual stable housing for people before they, before they leave jail. Um, all of that is incredibly important and, and uh, is, is necessary if we're going to ensure that people who are coming home can get their lives back. Uh, are you hopeful as I am? Because there's, there's part of me, I look at what happened on January 6th and I say it was a horrible event. Uh, it's tragic for our country. It was destructive for our country. It was divisive. If there was something positive that can come out of it is all of these people who have been arrested for their crimes have gone through a system that isn't, isn't user-friendly. And everybody tells me, don't get in the system because once you're in, your life is never your own. Um, do, you, do you hope as they come out, as more awareness comes, that, that maybe some of these changes happen when the people who were joking about it just being, you know, color TV and gym memberships realize it's not Club Med, realize that this is real, this is real detrimental to lives and, and a, a cumbersome system. Do you hope then that maybe, maybe some things change? Now, I know I've had people say, you know, Donald Trump reformed prison. Um, it's not working. It didn't work. I do, I do think that there, you know, and when we, you know, we've done some research on this too, that, that there's actually, the public is really, uh, has a growing recognition that the things that are going to make our communities safer, the things that are going to make it so that there are fewer people locked in jail are the things that you said are too expensive, are the housing, are the healthcare, are the, 
is the education. And so uh, if, if our lawmakers could follow suit and actually put the money behind the things that are going to make a difference, I, I would have hope. For that. There you go. Uh, Rachel, I appreciate the time. As always, good stuff. Thanks for taking time for us. Thank you so much. Uh, Rachel Eisenberg, she's the Senior Director of Criminal Justice Reform there at the Center for American Progress. Check out their website, AmericanProgress.org. We're going to take a quick break. Right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. we working people. Come to talk. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1912. That was the birthday of Dorothy Height, a civil rights leader and a champion for black women domestic workers. Domestic workers had largely been left out of the labor protections passed as part of the New Deal. Dorothy had grown up seeing firsthand how this exclusion impacted the women who cleaned homes and did other domestic work. Dorothy was born in Richmond, Virginia. Her mother was a nurse in a black hospital. But when the family relocated to Pennsylvania, her mother could not find work as a nurse. Like many black women who moved north during this time period, Dorothy's mother took a job as a domestic worker. She worked long hours for low wages. As Dorothy became involved in civil rights organizing, she remembered the experiences of her mother. In 1957, she was elected president of the National Council of Negro Women. From that position, she became a leader in the effort to improve working conditions for domestic workers. She became one of the leaders of the National Committee on Household Employment. This committee brought together representatives from 23 organizations concerned about domestic labor. Dorothy explained the urgency of the effort, stating, Let's treat household employment as a profession in which workers have a contract and are assured fair hours and compensation, as well as coverage by our protective labor laws. Today, labor organizers are still fighting to win fair working conditions for domestic workers. Grassroots organizing has led states like New York and California to pass a Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights. Similar efforts are underway in other states to give workers the dignity and the respect that they earn. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Listening to the Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. So I, I, I saw this story out of uh, Minnesota. Uh, there's a nuclear plant there that uh, evidently is leaking low, what they're calling low-level radioactive material. Uh, they're saying it's leaking from a pipe for the second time. And what, what's, what's interesting to me. And, as, and look, I, I'm not a scientist. Anytime I hear leaking nuclear plant, uh, you know, being so close to Three Mile Island, uh, the mind goes, who knows? Uh, but evidently, this this XL Energy, uh, the people who run the nuke plant, uh, discovered back in November that they were leaking uh, about 400,000 gallons of water contaminated with this uh, tri- tritidium, I guess. Um, they didn't report, they reported it, but nobody bothered to tell the people around them. And this is one of those things you go, well, you know, regulators and 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 local politicians shouldn't, I, I know you don't want to cause mass panic, but, you know, just a thought. Well, evidently, they just found out it's it, it was leaking again. And as the story said, it was a, a few hundred gallons. I'm going, it was 400,000 back in November. Why now are you reporting it when it was hundreds of, of gallons more of this stuff? Uh, now, they've shut it down. And this could be, look, this could be, it's one of those things that, it could be just out of you know out of extreme caution. You know, hey, we we there, there's something dripping, something leaking. We gotta gotta figure this out, or it could be they have no idea how bad things are. Because here's the kicker: this plant was built in 1971. This pipe, evidently, is original. It's original, and you go, <clears throat> um, 
aren't you supposed to be swapping that stuff out from time to time? Doesn't doesn't this stuff corrode? And and this is the other part. You know, you go, okay, so they shut down after after a few hundred. This is when they decide to tell people after a few hundred, when it was four hundred thousand, um it was it was all hush hush. Uh I again <laughs> I come back to it going it's, it seems a little hanky to me. Seems a little weird that they would choose now, but this is what they've done. And look, this could be just you know, could be just out, like I said, out of out of extreme caution. Now, as I understand, the area around this is, well, a Republican stronghold. You would think they would you, they would be the people. No, never mind. Uh, they're the folks who are going to, you know, let's, we don't need to regulate nothing. We don't get, let, corporations are going to do what's in their interest. Um, yeah, never mind. Sorry, sorry I even thought about that for a second. Now, the kicker for me is evidently they were going to shut down for a planned shutdown on April 15th, which isn't too far down the road, which makes, again, I, maybe I'm just, you know, maybe I'm just overthinking this. You got pipes that are over 50 years old. Uh, you've got you know this uh, this leak that was evidently much worse back in November. Now leaking again. You could have just if it was just a little leak, only a couple hundred gallons. You could, you, I don't know. You could probably figure out how to eke through to PM. And good on them for not. But the fact that it's this close, they decided to shut it down. That I'll tell you that that makes me uh, that makes me curious. Now, what's interesting is this XL has applied for uh, a license to operate that facility in Monticello through 2050. So you're adding another 27 years onto this. I mean, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about it. Going, you know, it was built in 1971. Uh, that's a long time. I, I mean, 79 years of operation, if it makes it to 2050, that seems a bit excessive. Maybe it's just me. Uh, if you have thoughts on this, I, I gotta know. Uh, am I being over? Am I overreacting? Uh, considering it's this, it's fairly close to the Mississippi River. It could, well, lots, lots of, lots of questions here. Uh, if you've got answers, I want to hear it. Email me, Rick at theRickSmithShow.com. Quick break. Right back. energy equivalent of 600,000 Hiroshima bombs per day are being stored in the ocean, believe it or not. World's oceans hit highest temperatures ever recorded. We just keep waiting for things to get better, and they seem to uh, just be getting uh, worse. Entire West Coast salmon fishery closed due to relentless drought. Plus, our country's natural treasures define our identity as a nation. President Biden protects public lands and waters with new national monuments. All of that good and bad news straight ahead from Bradblog.com. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. The new UN report warns the climate time bomb is ticking and the world is running out of time to avoid catastrophe. We are nowhere close to making that Paris Agreement goal. To accomplish all of it, developed and the richest nations in the world.